Hello and welcome to another episode of the Gritty Hour. I have a very special guest today. Uh, I have John Templeman from JIB Machine Records in Cleveland, Ohio, a rare independent music label. How you doing, John? Welcome to the Gritty Hour. Hey, Tom. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Thank you. And I have am um, joined by co-host tonight, George Bauer out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, you've seen him on previous podcasts when we discussed all things music. If it's if it's music related, I get Georgie Bauer on, involved. So, um, hey, George, Georgie, partying with the Vegas Knights there. Congratulations! Yeah, it was some game last night. In fact, yeah. in fact, I, I got my I got my latest uh, my latest acquisition. My latest. Uh... There you go. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> all right. All right. So, John, I, I'm dying to know how uh, what what prompted you to start uh, your own music label in today's day and age. Well, the label is actually uh, 19 years old this year. Wow. So I started it in 2004. Um, I had been in a couple bands uh, that, uh, you know, like when most most bands go south. Um, I took a couple months off and wrote some songs. And a friend of mine at the time was, um, he was an engineer. He was working in New York City. And uh, I went there to visit and he had a little home studio. And so I recorded some demos and I'm like, I'm going to put these demos out and I'm going to start my own label. And, and then I'll also take these CDs that I had from these failed, two failed bands um you know that broke up and we had a bunch of cds left over and i'll distribute them too and you know have fun with it you know didn't really think much of it right um around the same time that i started jib machine i also started uh just kind of organically a band called hot ham and cheese which was on the label for many years and when hot ham and cheese started playing live uh, we were kind of like a I would say we were kind of like a punk metal band, like a hardcore type band, at, at least at first when we started. So we were playing on the same venue as metal bands, punk bands. And um, a band called Johnny Mohawk and the Assassins, their bass player, Gary Piston, said, hey, can we be on your label? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? And then that kind of started it to where I was, you know, not, I was signing people that I, you know, bands that I wasn't a part of. Um, and now it's just, you know, it's evolved over the years. It's had so many, you know, just twists and turns, mm -hmm. um, you know, now hot ham and cheese is no longer active. We're on an indefinite hiatus. Uh, I still do solo work and I still do, uh, I'm involved in a number of studio projects and I do play live with a couple of, uh, bands just for fun, like cover bands just for fun. Um, but, um, uh, we're we're basically now I'm kind of running the label um, about as legitimately as as you can for a record label. Um, <laughs> I signed a distribution a, a, a national, international and domestic distribution deal in 2020 in June of 2020. And ever since I would say, probably since 2015, I really started taking the label more seriously because it was like a traveling party for a long time because. I was busy with with my band and and playing live shows and recording music and all that stuff. And then uh, about 2015 is when I I decided to really get more serious about running the label like a business, and started making those strides, which led up to signing the distribution deal. And the last three years have been crazy to say mm. the least. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how it happened. Kind of just happened. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, walk, walk George and I through like, uh, like, do you have a physical recording studio? I do. Um, so I have a, I have a studio in my basement. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not, it's, it, I'm about to build like a very nice studio, but I just basically have my workstation and a bunch of amps and I have an, uh, electronic drum kit and you know, a lot of, a lot of outboard gear. Um, mm -hmm. but I also am, uh, one of my, uh, uh, bandmates in a project I have called Gwazi, Brandon Young's, has a studio track six recording. And Hot Ham and Cheese first recorded with track six back in 2005. So I've been doing projects with Brandon for, um, you know, 18 years now. Um, and so anytime I need to do something that involves, you know, a studio, studio, um, he's track six is pretty much the partner studio of Jib Machine. Now, right. Now I have artists that record all over, 
Um, and I do work with other people. Um, for example, JJ Ferris, who is the guitar player in Slam and Gladys. Uh, he produced their album out in LA. Um, an artist on the label, Cleo Alexandra from Australia. JJ produces her too. Um, they do a lot of that. He does a lot of that stuff in his studio, but she'll send him the vocal tracks and all that. They'll write the songs together virtually, then she'll mail him the vocal tracks. And it's a lot of it's done virtually. So I'm working with other people who are producing music, but I would say the main studio uh, outside of like my home studio is, is Track 6 Brandon's studio. With your permission, since we're going to talk about some of the artists on your label, yeah. I'm just going to share your website if that's okay. That's great. And um, I'm just going to go to your roster page as we as sure. we move along the conversation. But George, you had a question. Oh, uh, John, when you had growing up and when you first discovered music, who were those? Or who uh, who helped you get into? Like uh, I had friends. Tom had older brothers that got us going with our our mm. musical likes and dislikes. Uh, did you have someone like that? And who were the early artists that just made, you know, that just made you crazy about music? Um, so ironically, my parents were in a band together and that's how they met. And so from pretty much the time I was born, I was around music. I remember going to band rehearsals with them when I was probably two years old, like literally some of my earliest memories. They both like different styles of music. So there was always you know, something was always on the turntable around our house. I would say the two albums, two albums that I remember vividly uh, listening to a lot when I was a kid were uh, Led Zeppelin IV and uh, Kiss Rock and Roll Over um, were two albums <laughs> that I just, you know, wore out like that when I was right. like three, four years old. My mom's younger sister, my Aunt Jen too, was, she's only 12 years older than me. So when I was, you know, two she was 14 and so she was really into queen so like i remember going over to my grandma's and she would play me queen records and uh sheer heart attack is one that said like that's still probably my favorite queen album is sheer heart attack and so uh between my parents and my aunt and then my dad has a younger brother my uncle danny he introduced me to van halen i remember the first time i heard the very first van halen album with your eruption and you really got me and it, it just blew my mind. So one of the best debut albums ever, ever. So, I mean, I had, aside from my parents, I had aunts and uncles um, and I was just exposed to, you know, some of the, I think the best rock music to this day ever made, you know, whether you play guitar primarily, John, I play guitar primarily, but I also can play drums and bass. And I've always been the lead singer in the band, most of the bands I've been in. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've kind of, I can kind of do a little bit of everything. I, I think I'm a, uh, what's the saying? I'm a jack of all trades, a master of none. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I know enough to be dangerous on pretty much everything, but I'm not like a virtuoso guitar player um, or, you know, some genius bass player or anything like that. But, uh, but, you know, I, I, if I have an idea in my head, I have the ability to record it myself essentially. Mm. Well, I'll ask you two questions in one. In terms of the artists you uh, acquire for the label, mm -hmm. uh, number one, how do you find them? And number two, how much does your own personal taste govern what you look for and what you ultimately bring to the label? That's a good question. Um, I would say that I I like the majority of the music. I'd say all of the music on my label to some degree. Some I mm -hmm. like more than others. Mm -hmm. Um I think it would be hard for me to really get behind someone if I didn't like their music. And, right. and I understand that in the music business, as I've learned, it is a business. Uh, there's a difference between being a musician, a music lover, you know, a consumer and being in the music business. Um, you know, I do. But for me personally, I think it's important to like the stuff that I'm promoting. So I could, you know, I, I'm more motivated to get behind it and, and make sure that it, has a chance to succeed if I like it. Um, in terms of finding bands on the label, it's, it's a lot, it's been all over the place. Um, I've had people who I trust that I've worked with in the past recommend bands to me. Um, I I know, you know, know people like Dave Brooks right there we're looking at. Dave is the lead singer in Slam and Gladys, but I've known Dave for, oh geez, how long have I known Dave? Probably about 15 years or so. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he sings in a, a very popular cover band here in Cleveland. And when I first moved downtown, I used to go see them all the time. And then from that, I learned about Slam and Gladys. And actually I was, and they will admit this, I, I was credited with reforming Slam and Gladys, getting those guys back together. I was going to reissue their one and only album that they made back in the 90s, early 90s. And they were going to, the original guys got together, they were going to record one song as a bonus track. And then they ended up tracking seven songs and that turned into a new album. And there you go. And that just went from there, you know, and that was a whole um, wild journey, which we could probably talk for two hours about that. Mm -hmm. Um, Ended kind of, it didn't really end because the album's still out there and it's a fairly new record. But um, sadly, while we were in the midst of promoting that record, their bass player Al Collins suddenly passed away Uh and it really um, derailed, obviously derailed all the momentum that we had and and everybody involved in the band, including myself really had no desire to keep pushing it at that point. So we kind of just let it, let it go, you know, because it was, and ironically you had mentioned uh, before we started uh, uh, when we first got on this call, before we started the actual podcast, uh, you like to hold up my blue sky. Um, yes. The day that 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 was the second single from the record, and the day that the video campaign started to promote that was the day that Al passed. And wow. so it was just a very um, uh, just surreal and and sad situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and something that I don't think you know I've ever I had ever thought about having to go through. Um, even though there, I did have another artist on my label, Slowhand Jack, that passed away, but Jack was older and in poor health. Um, mm-hmm. so I don't think it was as much of a surprise as, as Al when he, when he passed. Right. So you had mentioned, like you had mentioned before, Cleo Alexandra, who we're looking at here is from uh, Australia. Yes. Yeah. So how would you, how would you even come across someone like that? That's an interesting, that's an interesting story. So, um, she was actually discovered by Keith Olson, um, music producer who who passed away a few years ago. Um, and Keith produced, geez, Fleetwood Mac, Rick Springfield, um, you know, a ton of Foreigner, a ton of classic rock bands. Um, and he discovered her and uh, J.J. Ferris was doing work with Keith. So he helped uh, with producing her first EP that was, I think came out in 2019. It was pre-pandemic. Um, they worked with uh, a guy by the name of David Shackler, who uh, David is a, he does a lot of promotions, music supervisor work. He's worked a lot on horror films since the eighties. He's credited, actually, he has a Wikipedia page. David's credited with discovering uh, Buckingham and Nick's getting queen speaking of queen getting getting them their record deal in america and Mm. uh he also was working with luke from two live crew when all that stuff happened with you know the the parents advisory council and you know getting the staff's wife (laughs) getting the yeah getting the censorship stickers on on releases and so um they worked on her project and then Keith passed away and she ended up moving to the UK for a while. And then she came back to Australia and contacted Keith and JJ and said, I've been writing some music. I really want to get back into the swing of things. Can you help me like get this going again? And um, uh, David had kind of counseled and helped us uh, with the Slam and Gladys record. And, And because of him, I actually met the gentleman, Clay Pasternick, who owns the distribution company that I wow. signed? With. So it's all network of people. Okay? Sure. Um, yeah. When the Clio, when when she reached out to those guys, David came to me and said, "Would Jib Machine put put this you know stuff out? Would you partner with us?" So the three of us entered into a partnership. Well, technically four of us with her, but David and JJ and I handle like the you know David David does the, David does the promotions, JJ did the production, and then I did the marketing and. Uh, you know, the release of the record. And then of course, Cleo is the talent. And so the four of us entered into a partnership. We call it team Cleo basically. Uh, <laughs> hmm. And, uh, and we've been working together now for geez. Well, her first single came out the end of last year, um, 2022. 
So we were working on that. We've been working with her probably close to two years now, I'd say. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a chance. I don't know, if, Georgie, did you have a chance to check any of the, the roster out? A little bit. I I, uh, I listened to a couple of songs by Slam and Gladys and yeah. Hostel Amish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is. And uh, uh, the F models. I know I, yeah. uh, John, and the podcast I listened to this morning, he, he told some stories about the, the F models. They're just interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a band that you're coming out with a, uh, at least the blurb on the page, just the one you're coming out with a um, retrospective from the eighties on them. So they actually, so this is an interesting, this is Jib kind of, I'm, I'm kind of involved in a bunch of different things with the label. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was more of a, uh, what would you call it? A kind of like a legacy project or, you know, like a, um, a, the F models were banned in the early eighties. They were extremely popular in the Kent Akron area outside of Cleveland. Um, they were basically getting huge in that, you know, post-punk uh, early MTV era. And they had a very charismatic singer by the name of, uh, he went by Iggy. Uh, Robert Morningstar was his name, but everyone called him Iggy. And um, right as they were at the height of their success, he took his own life. Oh. And Def Models kind of disappeared. So um, uh, a friend of mine, Marky Ray, um, it is an archivist. He has all sorts of unreleased, like cataloging all this archival material from all these bands from Cleveland and Akron and, um, and Kent and just the whole Northeast Ohio area. And um, I was introduced to him a few years ago and we had talked about doing a project together. And so... I said, well, send me a bunch of the stuff that you have and I'll listen to it and and then we'll start with one project and go from there. And so he sent me about five different bands of, you know, that all this, you know, unreleased, just lost music that he had. And the F model stood out. And when I talked with him about it, he's he's like, yeah, they were phenomenal. He's like, they they were, you know, he used to go see them when he was a kid. And he said, yeah, they're amazing. And so we went on this journey where essentially we com- compiled all this music. Um, we ended up really, Marky wrote an amazing story for the booklet. He had all these flyers and unreleased photographs, as you can kind of see with the front cover there. Right. Um, the, the CD is actually a double disc um, that consists of rehearsal recordings, live recordings, studio recordings, um, the second disc is a full live show from JB's, which used to be a huge bar um, that had live music in Kent, Ohio. And we had a 12 page booklet that had all these photos and a story that Marky wrote about the F models. And then we released it. This came out March 31st of this year. And a tribute band was formed called the Snot Rights. And we had a CD release show where Marky did a question and answer with two of the surviving members of the F models. And, um, and then the snot rights played like an hour long set of all F models songs. Mm. And they, people loved it so much like the snot rights or there's interest in them continuing to play. So it's pretty cool. Uh, they were, they were essentially a, a, you know, F models tribute band and that disc is sold extremely well. Um, we moved quite a few that evening. And it hasn't even been released digitally yet. We'll put it out digitally. I just saw Marky yesterday where you're talking about, you know, probably putting it out digitally like in the fall sometime. Mm-hmm. But we just put the disc out first. And um, it it was a fun project, a very cool project. And it's it's nice to, you know, for me, not only to promote like current artists that are trying to make their way, but to help preserve music like like just awesome music like this right um well well, for someone like me and whoever's listened that you know loves music but not sure how the music industry works when you say release it digitally you're talking about like spotify or okay is that your primary distribution outlet no so um with my distribution deal um we can get there's a number of big box uh distributors Obviously, Amazon is is its own animal, but there's a few other companies that can help us get discs pretty much anywhere. Like, for example, in Europe, 
certain countries have their own distribution companies, but we'll work with this one distribution company that could then, if we want to get stuff in Germany or Poland or the UK, then they'll get it to those distribution companies. So I'm not really, once I send it to Clay, who's my main contact, who I part, who's, who's my partner with the distribution stuff, he then takes care of it. He's been in the music business since the late sixties. He's a brilliant distributor. He's been, he's been slinging in it, slinging 45 records since the late sixties. And, you know, he's, he really knows what he's, what he's doing. He's, he's a great professional. Um, and so that's, there's that portion of it. And then our digital distribution is through the orchard, which is actually owned by Sony music. Mm -hmm. And I have a portal and I upload wave files and the artwork and all the information, the songwriter information, performance information, the publishing information, and then that gets delivered everywhere, you know? So release date is say, you know, September 1st, then it'll be, you know, and I upload it like next month, all the, all the materials, and then it gets delivered to Spotify, iTunes, Deezer, um, you Actually, know, I, I have seen Orchard on uh, YouTube as well. Yeah, so yeah. it is a yeah, and in YouTube, it gets the stuff gets delivered to YouTube. It just it's a one stop where you upload it, and then it gets delivered to like a hundred different hmm. um, digital outlets online, streaming and download outlets. Online. Well, now I know how that works. Yeah, so that's kind of how it works, you know. When hmm. I'm but, and and normally, sometimes things are both. Sometimes things are most of the time i would say things are there's some physical aspect to it i usually do short run cds sometimes cassettes um like i mentioned i'm uh i'm partnered with a label down in virginia called twice as high records we're putting out a rush tribute album that'll be out in early 2024 that's a vinyl record um but there's usually a, a physical component of some sorts and then digital and then sometimes i'll just put stuff out digitally like Cleo Alexandra stuff has, we've just been releasing singles um, with the eventual goal of putting out an album comprised of all her, you know, um, her, her stuff that's coming out digitally now. Right. But uh, it's just, you know, it just, it just depends on the project. It depends on a number of things. The F models, we thought it would make sense to just do CDs first mm -hmm. um, and then eventually put the digital, the digital release out. Well, Georgie, I'll give you a heads up if you haven't checked out the David Curtis band. Uh, there's a song that's right up your alley. I don't trust myself, it's called. <laughs> I, I know George's taste in music, and that'll fit right into his uh, right into his uh, digital. David's a good uh, friend of mine. He's, yeah. he's here in Cleveland. Um, he works with some really great producers. He, he does a lot of his own music. He works with um, a guy out of Akron by the name of Dylan Roth. And, um, and he has, uh, another uh, person that he works with, uh, down in Nashville. Um, and they, you know, he, he, he digitally sends them their track, his tracks and they do stuff to it and they send it back and so on and so forth. He's working on some new stuff. Like a couple of weeks ago, he sent me some of his new song. That's really got an, an edge to it. If you like down the drain, it's kind of along those lines. He's kind of going in that direction and pushing pushing his music more in that direction. Yeah, I checked out a few of his songs. It, yeah, it's ac actually a variety of styles he yeah. uses. Yeah. Yeah. George, anybody else you liked? Uh, that's the list that I had. Uh, you'll be happy to learn, Tom, that John is a big Springsteen fan too, like us. So, How are you? I didn't even know that. Okay. Yeah. Love Springsteen. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, just... Growing up, my my parents, my mom particularly, were Elvis Elvis fans, and then then uh, Spring, Tom got me into Springsteen, so I've been a big, big Springsteen fan. But I had an Elton John too was a big one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in between that, I kind of went went on a veer to a prog rock period of time for a few years, and became like an insane Yes fan. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of all over the place, but Tom stayed sort of on the springsteen and meat and rock potatoes and roll. rock and roll that's yeah, me, yeah. Can, yeah so that's what kind of where we're coming from with in the back of our minds but uh you know i, I love bruce i've seen him probably over a hundred times and all what's your things. favorite bruce album oh darkness on the edge of town me right? too me yeah, too it's, it's, <laughs> i agree 
Yeah, it, it's it's just it's just fantastic. It just rings true so much. And uh, when you're 16, it really rang true too. Yeah. 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 Um, John, I, I don't know how much you can divulge at this point, but I'm I'm interested, and George is probably interested too because he is into progressive rock too. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Rush uh, tribute. Yeah. album coming out now what's involved in that is there some of the bands from your label doing rush no. songs or how does that work the only band that's on my label is wazi that one of my projects and uh -huh. we did a we did like a um a doom metal cover of working man uh because we're from cleveland so mm -hmm. and that and and working man was pretty much broke and on cleveland radio and that was what really brought rush to the forefront like cleveland radio started playing working man and it, it that was like what started them you know down their path of you know the insane career that they had um and then uh there's artists from all over the country a couple i think someone a couple from canada um and it starts with the songs are in chronological order that rush released them in so working man is first because it was on their first out and then it goes down the line mm -hmm. and um and it's some bands i think stayed a couple of the bands tried to stay somewhat true to rush's version of those of the respective song but there's a lot of like unique stuff um there's one young lady who did a cover of subdivisions and it's acoustic and it's fantastic it's probably my favorite song on the record is her version of subdivisions um but we're we're currently working on a release plan for this and how we're gonna how we're gonna put it out pre-sale how we're gonna put it out um we also plan to hopefully make enough money to where if we make our money back then we will um which we should we will donate a portion of our net proceeds to uh, a charity Oh. Um, most likely the one that um, it's, I can't think of it, but the one that has to deal with what Neil Pert died of uh, cancer charity. So mm -hmm. it's, it, we have a lot of plans. Nothing is set in stone. It took a while to just get the record to the pressing plant. Mm -hmm. And as you guys know, there's a, there's a huge demand uh, for vinyl and there's not enough plants to press it. So we're on like the nine month schedule uh, we should have copies of this hopefully if everything goes well with the test pressings and whatnot we should have copies by november and it will come out at some point in early 2024 probably january or february i would say sweet well, i can I personally yeah <laughs> i can personally vouch for the fact that lps are back in vogue oh yeah um that, does that come into your uh business model uh you, you mentioned you have a company that does the pressing for the CDs. I work with different companies. Oh, it, okay. It depends. It depends um, how many I'm ordering. Uh, for example, uh, Mike Onesco. I don't know if you listen to any of his stuff. Mike's in the Mike has a band called the Blindside Blues Band. It's been around forever, and Jim Machine is putting out um, the first Blindside Blues Band. Uh, record of original material studio album of original material on Jim machine it's the 16th blindside blues band album overall um with that i'll get a large amount of discs so i'll work with a certain company with that if i'm doing a smaller run of discs i'll work with a different company and mike's album slated to come out on august 18th and um the following month about a month later he's doing a three city tour of poland um, so I'm most likely, I'm about 99% sure that I'm going over to Europe for a couple weeks in September. Oh, good for you. Yeah. So it should be fun. Yeah. yeah. And ironically, believe it or not, Jib Machine, it kind of shows the tastes of the audience. Jib Machine sells twice as much music in Europe than we do in the United States. Wow. So you have a pretty healthy following over there. Your roster does pretty crazy the yeah. records that we move in europe it's yeah. and no one's other than mike no one's really ever toured over there mm -hmm. um now al collins before before he passed he and his wife had a band called stacy collins and the almighty three they used to tour europe all the time they'd go over there for two three months at a time then they'd come back to the states for a month then they go back to europe mm -hmm. um, but slam and gladys never toured over there um so it's just it's just it's fascinating to me how 
European still a by physical product and B um, still really appreciate good rock music over America. <laughs> well, that begs the, that, that begs the question. Uh, do they, are they back in LPs too over there? I think so. Or did um, they ever not? I, would, I would assume so. I don't yeah. know. Mm. Um, you know, investing in LP, this, this rush tribute is a big test for me to see how this goes because it is really expensive to press vinyl. Um, to press a thousand CDs is not is not a ton of money, especially if a guy like Mike Onesco, you know, the Blindside Blues Band is going to play shows behind it. You're gonna we're gonna sell a good amount of copies of that album. Um, I think every album I've pressed to him, we've had to do a repress mm -hmm. um, CDs. Right. But vinyl records are different. Um, you know, there's there's a stat I read the other day that over half the people that buy a vinyl record don't even own a turntable. So I think people are doing it for collector's sake, you know, and then they just listen to the, they either download it or they listen to the record on Spotify. I just, I just got the new, um, the new Foo Fighters album and I'm still waiting for the new Avenged Sevenfold album to arrive at my house, but I downloaded both those albums anyway. So it's convenient for me to listen to them on my phone, but I bought the vinyl record because I also, I, I, one is the Foo Fighters album is white vinyl. And then the Venn Sevenfold, I guess they released their new album in a bunch of different colors. I got the brown vinyl. And so I'll listen to those. And I also have a um, a radio show on WCSB, which is the college radio uh, station of Cleveland State University. And so I like playing vinyl on the air you now on, mm. my, on my show. So I like buying records just for that, too. You know? Yeah. Foo Fighters, I think, are going to support that with a tour yeah they're already out they're already touring they yeah. were just in ohio they were at a there was a festival down in columbus called sonic temple over memorial day weekend they played i was actually contemplating driving down mm -hmm. um but i it just was too much too they, did a three, they did a three-night residency here in vegas and i saw them for one of their shows and, and this was before the passing of taylor yeah they were just they were just fantastic just a they're great, great. Yeah. I saw him a bunch with Taylor. Yeah. Um, you know, they were a great live band. Yep. A lot of and energy. Funny, uh, a little side story. A gentleman I went to high school, he ended up becoming a firefighter. He uh, entered a contest back when we were kids for the Foo Fighters to, to play in the, in the garage. And he won. So they, <laughs> the Foo Fighters showed up at his door in Yonkers, New York, and they <laughs> they put everything they put everything in the garage, and they set up the band, and he called all his friends, and they filmed it. It's it's online somewhere, but that's uh, yeah, insane. He, no shit. Yeah, he wow. Won, he won that contest. Yeah, John Sipa is the gentleman's name, but uh, yeah, uh, they actually. That. I was not there, unfortunately, but there's a little independent record store where I grew up outside of Youngstown. Uh, called the record connection and the guy jeff burke that runs it super cool dude he's been he's been in business for like 40 years uh, a few years ago the foo fighters were dave grohl was the ambassador for record store day and he got they were in cleveland for the rock hall and the rock hall ceremony happened to be in cleveland that year they were going to be in town for that so the foos went to this record the record store and they had let 100 lucky people got in and they played like an hour long set at the record store. Wow. This was probably say about seven or eight years ago. Mm. I met Omar Hakim yesterday. I think I told you that Georgie. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it was a big thrill for me. Cool. He's one of the He's best drummers set. in the world, in my opinion. And I pulled up his resume, you know, he played with weather report too, which uh, is connected for me with uh, Chester Thompson, who was the drummer for, he was Genesis is, uh, touring drummer so i i made that connection uh, ah yeah, so, but yeah, he yeah, played on the song yeah. um david bowie modern um uh, modern love mm. never gonna fall for yeah yeah, yeah great yeah. song he's a great drummer and i met him yesterday it was made my day so cool. tell us about some of your other artists uh john okay tom where are you from are you from new york i'm from well uh, george and i both grew up together in new york yeah okay well the nihilistics are from new york they actually or one of the they're basically one of the godfathers of hardcore punk uh -huh. they formed in the late 70s they used to play cbgb's all the time um 
and Jib signed them a couple years ago and reissued some of their older recordings. Sweet. Um, I just talked to them this week. They're coming to Cleveland for their first ever Cleveland show later this year. Nice. Um, and we may have some new music from them pretty soon. Uh, so that's that they're from NW70, another uh, hardcore band on the labels from New Jersey. Oh. Um, so a couple bands out your way. Um, we talked about Slam and Gladys. Is it all through word of mouth that they come to you to? For, to be on the label or do you go so, out and I, i'm not i don't actively recruit okay um, you know i how can i put it this way i got enough work to deal with <laughs> so <laughs> i like working with the bands that i work with and mm -hmm. um you know uh you know if i want to add more bands I'm, I'm sure i could i mean there's there's a lot of talent here in cleveland um, but at this point it's, it's just managing what we have, um, trying to, you know, devote attention, uh, to people when it's time, you know, when yeah. they have new music, like really been working, working it hard with Cleo Alexandra for like the past year mm -hmm. now with, with blindside blues band, Mike Vanesco with this album coming out, I'm really going to focus on that. Um, you know, going over to Europe and getting the record out and all that good stuff. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only one of me. I do have, I mean, as I said, I have a distribution team. The label has a publicist. Um, so I do have help. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the label itself and managing the bands, making sure the records get done, pressed, that, I mean, that's putting the marketing plan together. And yeah. I do, you do a lot of similar things, but every band's different in and has different uh, audiences. And so um, I would say that every marketing plan is different right? Um, for every well, bit. You do have an easy to use uh, website. And I did want to mention to those listening to us and not watching us on YouTube, uh, we're, we're viewing his website, which is jibmachine.com. So jibmachine.com. That's right. And what I like about this site, um, John, is that, you can easily check out every artist. The, each one is the, each page is designed the same for each artist, and all of their social media, if you will, links are all right on the right. I usually go to YouTube to check it out. In fact, this afternoon that's what I spent my day doing, checking out these bands. And it's easy to use website. So if you're listening to us rather than watching us, go to jibmachine.com. If you like the site. Um... The person that designed it, his name is Paul Needham. He lives in Germany. Wow. <laughs> he does a lot of he does a lot of website work and graphic work, uh, nice. covers, logos for Jib Machine. Uh, met him through Slam and Gladys. He actually designed that Slam and Gladys cover. I was just going to ask you about the design. Uh, part of your services to a band is design, or do they usually if, do that themselves? If they need it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I have connections, you know, and people that I work with across the board, you know, so websites, logos, uh, album covers, studios, as we've discussed, I have the distribution, um, I have a publicist that helps with reviews and, you know, marketing, getting the word out, um, and then plus the work that I do, you know, mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, you know, we can offer bands definitely uh and, and i think our deals are fair more than fair um <laughs> especially when you look at uh historically how the music business operates yeah um, i don't think it the business end of it was ever really all that artist friendly um mm -hmm. I, i'm an artist myself so i obviously try to be artist friendly because i know how i would want to be treated and therefore that's kind of how i how i run my business so mm -hmm. um you know they're I can we can do any number of things some people are more self-sufficient than others uh they come to me with literally a finished product and say here um others need help more help yeah that now, changes the scale of your go ahead George I'm sorry I was just going to ask John now now you've got jib machine going for like almost 20 years now correct yes yeah. so, next year will be 20 years and it's uh in those 20 years, because the music industry with digital and online has changed so much, what, ha in your opinion, what has been the good and the bad of that change over the 20 years that you've been in place with this, with this business? 
Good question. Um, I think the good with digital is that well, digital obviously is what really changed. Um, when I first started the label, just CDs were really popular. And, um, you know, we were actually making pretty good money because the margins on CDs are not bad. Um, but then downloads came and still not bad. You know, you weren't making as much, but still not bad. And then streaming came. <laughs> and, uh, Streaming, you know, it's, it's it's amazing. Like Cleo Alexandra, for example, had tens of thousands of streams. Um, if those were downloads, we would have had some serious cash, right? But they weren't, they're streams. Uh, but the good thing about, so the bad downside is, is the royalty payments are smaller, right? The, the positive of that is you can, and this is how I think really, if, if you're if you're good at, build, you know, uh, pulling people in, use streaming as a way to get yourself noticed, to get people to check you out. Then if they like you, hopefully they'll go to your website and pick up an out, pick up a physical album or a t-shirt or, you know, something like that. But so streaming is good for discovery. Um, but there's no, there's no remuneration for streaming. For the artist you get like 0. 0.001 cent a stream. oh very small very so small. it's like you got to have a lot of streams to actually make significant money mm. um I, I forget what it was to like you'd have to sell like if you sold like five cds you'd have to get something in the neighborhood of like a hundred thousand streams or something like that to make the same amount of money mm. So that's why I guess that's why a lot of these artists that you know when George and I were kids these artists are still on tour today in wheelchairs and crutches because that's the only way to make money right right you and know? even that's been difficult after after covid because oh sure yeah because uh you know a lot of venues closed that never reopened a lot of people that were in the industry you know like your sound guys your roadies your techs um either got other jobs or retired and then the ones that are left that are really good are expensive mm -hmm. and then you know there's only so much there's only you know there's a high demand for them and there's only so many of them to go around mm -hmm. so it's it's increased and then now you've got these venues that try this shit like they got to take a percentage of your merch like that's bullshit i'm sorry mm -hmm. it just it just is like you you make ticket sales and if you're smart you're selling beers for 10 bucks a piece or 15 bucks a piece. You make your money that way. You leave the band's merch alone. That's how bands literally get from one place to the next and actually have money. You know, that's it's selling. You're, you're essentially a traveling t-shirt salesman nowadays, you know? Yeah. Um, is that a lot of, is that a, your artists? Is that a lot of their income from merch sales? Not a lot of artists are touring on the label right now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when they are out, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's you playing shows and, and selling shirts, slinging shirts. I mean, that's that's really, you know, how a lot of these bands make their make good money is sure. by doing sure. that. And a lot and nowadays, you know, back in the day, you'd make a record and concert tickets because people were people complain about the price of concert tickets. It's well, back in the day, they just wanted you to buy the record because that's where they were making all their money. So concert tickets were cheap. Now it's completely flip flop. You know, you make a new album just to have a marketing piece, to have content to throw out there that's new and get people interested in your music again. So they come to your show, um, you know, and, and hopefully buy a ticket and buy a T-shirt, right. whatever else, you know. So it's uh, it's just really weird. Um, it's a weird business. I can tell mm -hmm. you that my gr I grew up, my grandfather owned a grocery store and uh the thing with grocery stores is there's a lot of products with low margins, right? Like your hope is if someone comes in a grocery store, they'll pick up your sale items, you know, your two liter of Coke or your canned vegetables, but then you're hoping that they maybe buy something from the bakery, buy some lunch meat, because that's where you're making, you know, the higher mar margins on those products. In the music business, there's a lot of low margin products. Um, so you, you know, you hope people are buying shirts, because that's where you make some money on shirts, um, even CDs like physical and especially vinyl. 
Um, you're moving that stuff. You actually are on the road and moving that stuff. You're make the margins are pretty nice with that. But like the whole digital end of it is, like I said, it's more discovery. Unless you're just some mega star that gets hundreds of millions of streams, um, it's really hard to make money that way. Yeah. Yeah. As as George pointed out, it's changed everything in the last since you've been in business. Yeah. Last 19, 20 years, everything's changed. So For you know, sure. the, even the big labels are not as big as they used to be because of that. You know, yeah. well, a lot of them have, have joined together. I'm so. glad you pointed out that there is there was always secondary, you know, residuals like the sound man at a show. What during COVID, the sound man, the guy that tuned drums, you know, the guy that whatever. There's an engineer, sound engineer. There's a lot of guys that had to fall out of the business because of that. That's right. You know, and 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 you mentioned before how. Uh, cost prohibitive making a vinyl is because there's less manufacturers of vinyl out there so they can charge a higher price yeah, yeah. well in the materials it's just expensive mm. um i think what's it going to cost us per record way more than a cost per cd you can get you can get a cd for like a buck buck and a half a piece mm. vinyl records once you get done with the actual vinyl and then the act the art you know the um if you pay an artist um you know all your other fees involved you're looking at anywhere from like seven to ten bucks a record wow you know that's why vinyl's so expensive that's why when you yeah. go in a record store and vinyl's 25 30 bucks it's because yeah. you know first there's the cost of it and then everybody of course in the in the business everybody takes their cut along the way um, yeah. And so to make even a, a few bucks a record, three, four dollars a record, you got to price it at that price point. It's yeah. not like they're gouging you like there's a reason they're that expensive. Right. You know? Right. It's basic economics, it's basic supply and demand, you mm -hmm. know, and, and and the cost associated with that. So I wanted to touch a little bit more on some maybe some of the artists uh, on your on your roster that we didn't discuss yet. Mm -hmm. uh, like I see Haley Marie. Mm hmm. Yeah, she did a two song EP a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, very talented uh, young woman here from Cleveland. Uh, Squid from the Hostel Amish brought her to my attention. He he produced that. Um, I actually I think played guitar some guitar on that for her. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, she's she's really talented. La I haven't talked to her in a minute. And the last time I did, I saw she was applying and for trying to get on American Idol. So hopefully huh. she does because it's like great. <laughs> It'd be great know? for great for Jib Machine too. Eli, Eli, Eli Guitar Man, Eli Guitar Man <laughs> Fletcher has been on the label for a long time. He's a great Cleveland staple. Um, he Eli Fletcher is his, is his name, but then he dresses up like Guitar Man and he busks around town. Ah, uh, but he he he's got some great songs. Um, very creative artist. I just got a text from him today he just got a bunch of new guitar man t-shirts made that will be available here soon sweet um and he's he's a great guy too i've been friends with him for probably 15 years so he just hangs out on the corners does he hang out by the hall of fame and uh yeah belt out a few songs yeah yes yes yeah, he good. Does. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. um Guazi is one of my projects. Um, this is one of your band. Are you in this band? Yeah. Brandon, oh, okay, cool. Brandon and I, uh, my, who I mentioned has the studio. This is our started off. We did one album in 2015, the rise and fall of the Indigo in. And then anytime we um, make a record or work on production together, because there's things that and we've also produced music for like movies and stuff like that. Oh, it's all under the Guazi banner. And we're actually working on, we have all the music recording and recorded, and I did one vocal track last week. We're doing a black metal, like death metal album. Mm. So our music's all over the place. It's gone from rock to kind of hard rock to like thrash metal. Now we're doing this like death metal album, and it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Keeps things keeps things interesting. Absolutely, yeah. keeps the blood flowing. That's right. Yeah. The Amish Hot ham and cheese. Have been on, the Hostel uh, Amish have been on the label since 2006. Oh. They're one of the longest standing bands. Besides Hot Ham and Cheese, um, they're probably one of the longest standing bands on the label. They're legendary Cleveland punks. 
Um, they called their style of music barncore. They dress up like Amish dudes and play pop rock <laughs> music. And so uh, very entertaining, very fun. Um, they and ride horses check... to the show, right? What? They ride horses to the show? No, not quite that. <laughs> they like to drink beer. Uh, they, well, they we like have that drink. in common. They like to drink beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see who else is there. Hawk is uh, he's in a couple. So he's uh, he's in a band called um, Mouth of Clay, and also in a band called uh, Concrete Gypsy that Jib put out those releases. He is from Sweden, so he's another international artist on the label. In addition to Cleo being from Australia, Hawk is from Sweden. Mm. Um, I met him because I was doing some third party distro for a label out of Italy called a karma records about five years ago and mouth of clay's, uh, first album was one of those records. And then we struck up a friendship and then he said, uh, one day he emailed me and he's like, yeah, this new music I have doesn't really fit a karma. Do you think Jib would be interested in putting it out? Um, and that's when we put it songs from the wasteland was the mouth of clay record that Jib released right it was set to go out in 2020 it, it was released during the pandemic because it was already in motion and i just it, it, i did cancel the what we had planned later in the year for 2020 but that was already out yeah um, when you say you cancel like 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 shows or no i canceled like releases that i had that was oh. out later in 2020 and i see then i signed the distro deal too so i wanted to get that all squared away and mm -hmm. also it was pointless to put stuff out at that point in time. And I thought it was better to wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we did. Well, the shut-ins would have, you know, people are stuck at home, you know. They could have bought it, but it, yeah. it was just, it was a weird time. Yeah, it was know. weird for all of us, yeah. It was weird. And it just, you know, there wasn't a really, a, a, there wasn't a manual to tell you what to do. Yeah. So you just kind of, eh it's probably best to just not put the stuff on it. And when, this I you? Signed, when I signed the distro deal, <laughs> I created a lot of work because I had to move the catalog over uh -huh. um, and it took a long time. It took like six months to do that. This so, is you, I'm assuming J camp 13, J yeah, temp 13. Me. Yeah. So I released my solo stuff under J temp 13. Okay. Um, I came out with two albums last year, a uh, full length called America or bust that I worked on mainly during the pandemic. It was mm -hmm. my pandemic album. And then I did a small little project called Acoustic Punk where I remade some of my heavier tracks using acoustic instruments, drums, acoustic bass, acoustic guitar. Yeah. Um, so there's still it's still a heavy vibe, but it's uh but it's with acoustic instruments, not you know, distorted guitars. Well, this reminded me, I know we're taking up a lot of your time already, but uh, the video element of the music, because I did, when I went through some of your roster today, I did see a lot of them like produ produced videos, uh, you know, with sketches and everything. Who handles that? Is that part of the jib music? Uh... That's all over. Um, okay. You know, it depends. There's like this, looking at just my videos here, religion class song, I actually um, used, I found a filmmaker in Spain that I really loved her stuff and I reached out to her and I told her I wanted to make this really kind of like dark video. Um, and, and, and she like totally got my vibe and she's like, so you want it kind of like Marilyn Manson esque? And I said, yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm thinking about. So if you watch that video, it's kind of tripped out. My mom recently discovered it. Um, it popped up on her. She was watching YouTube at home and it popped up and she called me and she goes, what's wrong with you? She's like, pull that down. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's art. I'm not going to take down art. Uh, and she's religious. That, so that was filmed in Spain? Yeah. Wow. She's okay. religious. My mom's religious and I'm not. So it's like, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a, a dichotomy there, but, uh, and then, um, Canopsia, I worked with, um, for that lyric video, I worked with a company called hip, hip video promo out of New Jersey. Um, they actually, we do a lot of work with them on promotions. They do amazing. They're one of the top video promotion companies in probably the world, definitely the United States, but they also can produce videos too. So I worked with them to produce and promote that video. That was like the main single from America or bust, mm -hmm. um, that featured Mike Onesco and the late Al Collins played bass on that. 
Um, and also through Al, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Michael Webb down in Nashville. Um, he played uh, B3 on it and he's, he's done a lot of, uh, he's pretty well known down there. He's, he's done stuff with Chris Stapleton and uh, he's, I think he was Hank Williams Jr.'s keyboard player live, like in like wow. from time too, uh, from what I understand. Mm. Um, so, you know, some really good, really good musicians. Um, I, you know, in the J1013 project, I kind of play most of the instruments, but then I have guests on my songs. Like I'll ask my friends like, oh, so-and-so would be great for a solo here. And maybe I'll have so-and-so play drums on this one, you know, so kind of just, just having fun collaborating, just making, making music, make creating good art. You know, I think you were born with the gift of uh, not knowing what you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is there anything else I missed out, George? Uh, uh, let's go through the store, uh, see what's available, where people can buy things if they're interested. Okay, yeah. So the store is going to be sold out, though, John. Right. So the stores, there's two things. If you go to Bandcamp, okay. that will take you to our Jib Digital page, which is it doesn't have all Jib Machines releases, but it has a number of releases on there. If you scroll down, there's a lot of um, a lot of releases um, available through that digitally now this is just this money would go directly to the label you could get all of our stuff on itunes spotify deezer youtube like i said earlier um, but if you wanted to download an album this is this would be a good place to come and then if you go to the merch bucket page um which is uh if you go back to the website oh yeah I, I, i'm and, sorry yeah that's okay and select merch bucket this is where you can get physical products um you can get t-shirts you can get whatever's for sale um you know um let's go to your page see what's available i think i just have oh just the canopy cds oh no you got some underneath that eh? oh yeah i got cds yeah. oh I cds okay cds um but like if you go, say you go to the Hostel Amish's page, for example, they've got all kind of t-shirts there. If you go to their page, you can get CDs, but then they've got t-shirts. I see. Okay. So this is yeah. where you could buy a lot of the physical physical products mm -hmm. uh, of the label. Right. Well, cool. Very good. Well, I, I enjoyed visiting your record label, learning a lot. I, I also learned a lot about how it works, which I knew nothing about, the record industry. Cool. Um, and we'd be looking forward to that Rush tribute album. Yeah, stay, stay in touch. Yeah, I, I want copies of that. I'm, okay. I, I got a buddy, out, a buddy out here is a huge Rush fan. He'd love a copy, so I will, I will definitely be in You touch know, the packaging it. is really awesome, too. Um uh ryan who's the owner of tah records um he got someone to do this painting and it's it's phenomenal and i think we're putting it out in two different colors i think we've got like an orangish kind of color and then like a bluish kind of vinyl color so there'll be two different colors um the music's really good uh like i said it's very creative it's not rush right i mean who's rush right. though? they're one of the greatest bands of all time but it is it's if you're a Rush fan, I think you'll appreciate it, and I think obviously since we're not we're, we're not going to get any music from them anymore, it's a it's a nice thing, and I think we're gonna we're having we've been having fun with it, and I'm excited to see what happens with the album. When yeah, I'm looking forward to that myself. Yeah, and and George will yell at me if I don't ask you this because we you you guys mentioned uh, Springsteen before. Cleveland was a big early hub for Springsteen um philly cleveland That's right george kid leo, kid leo. Kid leo. Yeah, yeah 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 well we, i had many bootlegs from cleveland of springsteen shows the agora, um, the agora 78 yeah yeah he said it's been his home his way from home so i got the on this last tour that he just did um i saw him my uncle lives down in greensboro north carolina so i drove down there and saw him in march march end of march like last weekend in march and then like two weeks later, he was here in Cleveland. And I saw him in Cleveland. Mm. So I got to see him a couple of times on this last tour. Um, just still awesome. 73 years old, still kicking ass, playing three hour shows. It's just, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. 
One of the best nights of my life. George was standing right next to me. We saw him first row Madison Square Garden, 1980, for the River Tour. The River. Yeah, and then a week later we saw him at the Nassau Coliseum. So, but no, but the reason why I brought it up is I was going to say I know you don't scout a lot locally for artists because actually that's a good way of looking at it. The way you had it, which was you don't want to get so big that you're not giving personal touches to each artist right but i was just curious if you could give us a little breakdown of what's going on in the cleveland music scene currently well um i would say that there are it's a healthy scene for a lot of the younger bands uh i'm not going out as much as i used to Uh uh, but i am familiar with some of the younger bands in town and um uh for example mike onesco uh two guys that played on his album his blindside blues band record um eric bass player and holden the drummer they're in a band called truss Mm. um they have a female lead singer named hannah and they're tearing it up they just been posting this week they're doing like they're playing all over all summer they're playing chicago and columbus and they're doing uh north by northwest in toronto Mm. So they're, and they're, they're probably all, I'd say in like their mid twenties. Um, so the so music scene, the music scene in Cleveland is still thriving with young artists coming up. I would say so. I would say yeah. so. I mean, um, there's a, there's a club in town, no class that has a lot of metal and punk. I mean, that's, that's where the nihilistics are going to play when they come into town here later this year. Um, but I would say that I'm even somewhat removed to a degree from the music scene here mm. because I'm just not, I'm older and I don't care. <laughs> well, it sounds like you, you I've played lived, it. I've lived yeah. through that and then some. Many, well, it many sounds like you played is pretty full anyway. In fact, <laughs> I was getting tired just listening to you. I was getting out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you coming on tonight, John. Oh, thanks uh, for having me. And Georgie, I appreciate you co hosting tonight. Of course. Um, John, a pleasure. And I'm going to be all over nice. your site next weeks yeah nice me to too you. enjoy that enjoy that uh championship parade there yeah they're go- it's gonna be saturday night uh, it oh, looks like cool. so that's gonna be interesting on the, on strip. the strip so yeah oh yeah. man that's gonna be awesome yeah so we saw book- gold- my buddy lived there i saw a golden knights game there um probably about i don't know four or five years ago it was maybe their second or third year in the league i saw right. i saw a golden knights game it, amazing arena Tons of energy. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. It's terrific. It's really terrific. Yeah. But it was a pleasure. I had a lot of, I enjoyed this very much. Tom, yeah. Thank you. I learned a lot, John, and we appreciate your time tonight. That's Jib Machine Records. I definitely uh, would recommend checking it out, whether you're watching us or listening to us. So, and thanks again. We'll see you. We'll see you. Maybe have you back on when that uh, Rush album comes Let's out. Let's do that. That's All right. Sounds cool. Idea. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night, man. Good night.